where to begin? Can we begin at the beginning? What's happening in Ukraine, what's been unfolding since November in the streets, is probably the single most important international story underway today. It may impact for a very long time the geopolitics of Europe, Russia, American-Russian relations, and a lot more. At the same time, uh, media coverage of this story particularly in the United States, has been exceedingly misleading. The realities are there is no the Ukraine. All this talk about Ukraine is on the front line of democracy. There are at least two Ukraines. One tilts toward Poland and Lithuania, the West, the European Union. The other told toward Russia. This is not my notion. This is what every public opinion poll has told us since this crisis unfolded. That about 40 percent of Ukrainians want to go West, 40% uh, want to stay with Russia, and it's usually true in these polls, 20% just don't know, or they're not sure. Uh, who precipitated this crisis? It was the European Union, in this sense. It gave the Ukrainian government, which, by the way, is a democratically elected government, if you overthrow this government, just like they overthrew Morsi in Egypt, you're dealing a serious blow to democracy. So if the crowd manages to essentially carry out a coup d'etat from the streets, that's what democracy is not about. But here's what the European Union did back in November. It told the government of Ukraine, if you want to sign an economic relationship with us, you cannot sign one with Russia. Why not? Putin said, why don't the three of us have an arrangement? We'll help Ukraine. The West will help Ukraine. The Chancellor of Germany, Merkel, at first thought that was a good idea. But she backed down for various political reasons. So essentially, Ukraine was giving an ultimatum. Sign the EU economic agreement or else. Now, what was that agreement? It would have been an economic catastrophe for Ukraine. I'm not talking about the intellectuals or the people who are well-placed. About ordinary Ukrainians, the Ukrainian economy is on the brink of a meltdown. It needed billions of dollars. What did the European Union offer them? The same austerity policies that are ravaging Europe, and nothing more, $600 million. It needed billions and billions. There's one other thing. If you read the protocols of the European offer to Ukraine, which has been interpreted in the West as just about civilizational change, escaping Russia, economics, democracy, there is a big clause on military cooperation. In effect, by signing this, Ukraine would have had to abide by NATO's military policies. What would that mean? That would mean drawing a new Cold War line, which used to be in Berlin, right through the heart of Slavic civilization on Russia's borders. So that's where we're at to now. One other point. These right-wing people, whom Anton thinks are not significant, all reports and I don't know when he was in Ukraine. Maybe it was long ago and things had gone. But the reports that are coming out of Ukraine are the following. One, the moderates, that's the former heavyweight champion boxer of Vitaly Klitschko and others, have lost control of the street. They've asked the people who have been attacking the police with Molotov cocktails and to vacate the buildings they've occupied to stop. And the street will not stop. Partly because, I'd say largely because, the street in Kiev is now controlled by these right-wing extremists. And that, that extremism has spread to western Ukraine where these people are occupying government buildings. So in fact you have a political civil war underway. What is the face of these people, this right wing? A, they hate Europe as much as they hate Russia. Their official statement is, Europe is homosexuals, Jews, and the decay of the Ukrainian state. They want nothing to do with Europe. They want nothing to do with Russia. I'm talking about this. It's not a fringe, but this very right-wing thing. What does their political activity include? It includes writing on buildings in western Ukraine, Jews live here. That's exactly what the Nazis wrote on the homes of Jews. 
when they occupied Ukraine. Uh, a priest who represents part of the political movement in Western Ukraine, Putin quoted this, but it doesn't make it false. It doesn't make it false. It's been verified. A West Euro Ukrainian priest said, we, Ukraine, will not be governed by Negroes, Jews, or Russians. So these people have now come to the fore. The first victims of any revolution, I don't know if this is a revolution, but the first victims of any revolution are the moderates. And the moderates have lost control of what they created, helped by the European Union and the American government back in November. And so now anything is possible, including two Ukraines. So let me start with some preliminary comments. Just how to think about the geography of Europe. This is a simple, if not simplistic, way of thinking about it. But here's a map. Uh, you can see where Ukraine is, you can see where Poland is, you can see where Russia is. The way I think about European security is there's France, Germany, Poland, Ukraine, and Russia. Of course, we're moving from west to east. These are the big kahunes, these are the big countries that matter. And of course, the two countries that matter the most historically are Germany and Russia, or for most of the 20th century, Germany and the Soviet Union. And I put them in red because, as you well know, both Germany and the Soviet Union fought bitter wars in Poland, in Ukraine, and we could add in Belarus as well, if need be. But as we go along here, you want to keep in mind that Ukraine is right next to Russia, and Poland is right next to Ukraine. And then out further west is Germany and France. Take this a step further. This is the ethnic breakdown of Ukraine. I'm going to show you a number of maps, all of which are designed to show you that Ukraine is a badly divided country. And what's taking place inside Ukraine today is in good part a civil war. And it, to that extent, it doesn't have that much to do with what the Russians or the West uh, are doing there. Uh, and as you can see in red uh, are mostly Ukrainian-speaking people. And then as you move further east, you're talking about uh, lots of Russians and certainly lots of Russian speakers. Uh, this is the Ukraine election of 2004. This is the election in the wake of the famous Orange Revolution, which I'll talk more about. Uh, as you can see, the country is badly divided. Uh, between the East and the West, the Russian speakers in the East and the Ukrainian speakers in the West. This is the 2010 election, which resulted in Yanukovych getting elected. I'll talk about President Yanukovych as we go along. He was elected in 2010. And you can see there uh, the voting patterns in the 2010 election look a lot like the voting patterns in the 2004 election. And then these are two recent surveys that came out um, from the International Republican Institute that's here in the United States. Uh, this one says, if Ukraine could enter only one international economic union, which of the following should it be? And of course, the blue is the EU uh, and the light blue uh, is the customs union, or actually the red is the customs union of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Um, and the cities up at the top are in western Ukraine, and the cities down on the bottom are in eastern Ukraine. So you can see very clearly that people in the west would like to join the EU. People in the east have little interest in joining the EU. Those are the EU numbers. Here are the NATO numbers. I mean, these two charts look virtually the same. But all of this tells you that you have a badly divided country. And the conflict between the West and Russia over Ukraine is played out in the context of this situation. This is a simple little view graph that shows Europe's dependent on Russian gas. It's quite clear from that view graph that 
many of the countries in Eastern Europe uh, and even countries like Germany are heavily dependent on Russian natural gas. And of course, that gives the Russians lots of political leverage in this crisis, and it makes it very difficult for us uh, to put pressure on the Russians. OK, those are just a number of preliminary comments I wanted to throw out just to set this up. Let's talk about the causes of the conflict. I think if you're going to talk about the causes of the conflict, you have to come at it from three different perspectives. First of all, you have to ask, what are the deep causes of the crisis? What are the structural factors that underpin this conflict? Then you have to talk about the precipitating causes, because the crisis broke out on February 22, 2014. Things were not terrible until February 22, 2014. And that's when everything went to hell in a handbasket. And the question is, what caused it then? If you focus on deep causes, it can't tell you why something happened in February 2014. But the precipitating causes are designed to get at that. And then what we want to talk about is the Russian reaction, why the Russians did what they did with regard to Crimea, with regard to eastern Ukraine. We want to talk about exactly what they did and then why they did it. So let's start with the deep causes. My argument is that the West is principally responsible for this mess, not the Russians. Uh, this, of course, is not the conventional wisdom in the United States. And in fact, except for Steve Cohen, who's now at Princeton, I mean, now at NYU, he used to be at Princeton, Henry Kissinger, and maybe a handful of other people. Uh, there are not many people who agree with me. But uh, I, I think the facts are quite clear on this, that the West is responsible. And my aim is that the main deep causes, the aim of the United States and its European allies, to peel Ukraine away from Russia's orbit and incorporate it into the West. Our basic goal has been to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And Russia says, this ain't happening, period, end of story. And we will do everything we can to make sure it does not happen. That's the deep cause. Now, take it a step further. There are three key elements in our strategy. The first is NATO expansion, and in many ways, the most important. And I'll talk in some detail about that in a second. But as you all know, since the Cold War ended, starting with the Clinton administration, we have been moving NATO eastward toward Russia's border. And the Russians have said, this is an absolute no-no. And I'll walk you through the story in a minute. Second is EU expansion. EU expansion is all about integrating Ukraine economically into the West, the way we are in the process of integrating Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, the Baltic states, into the West. And of course, we're doing that with NATO as well. These are two sets of institutions, NATO, military institution, the EU, an economic institution. And the idea, again, is to take Ukraine, peel it away from Russia, and make it part of the West. The third part of the story is fostering an orange revolution. This is all about promoting democracy in Ukraine and in other places. As you all know, the United States runs around the world trying to topple regimes and put in their place democratically elected regimes. You go to Beijing, you talk to Chinese elites. The idea that we're promoting democracy around the world, and especially in East Asia, just drives them crazy because they think they're in the crosshairs. And you know what? They are in the crosshairs because our basic strategy is to topple regimes all over the world not simply because we like democracy, but because we believe that whoever gets elected will be pro-Western. So we're killing two birds with one stone. But those are the deep causes, those three strategies. NATO expansion, EU expansion, and promoting democracy. What about the precipitating cause? The key events leading up to the coup. 
It's the coup of February 22nd, 2014 that's of enormous importance. That's what really throws the crisis into gear. Just think about that word, coup. Orange Revolution, promoting democracy. The coup, February 22nd, 2014. So the question is, what causes the coup? It all starts in November of 2013. At that point, Yanukovych, President Yanukovych, who's the head of Ukraine, is negotiating with, e, with the EU to form an association agreement that brings the EU and Ukraine much closer together. It's a step in the direction of incorporating Ukraine into the European Union, or to put it in slightly different terms, incorporating Ukraine into the West. The Russians make it clear that this is unacceptable. The Russians are willing to do a deal that involves the EU, Russia, the IMF, and Ukraine. But the idea that Ukraine is going to do a deal exclusively with the EU and the Russians are going to be left out in the cold is not something that Putin is willing to countenance. He puts significant pressure on the Ukrainians. He offers them a terrific deal. And as you can imagine, the EU is not offering Ukraine a particularly good deal because you know how much corruption there is in Ukraine. And the EU wants Ukraine to eliminate that corruption which the Ukrainians really don't want to do. So what Putin does is not only make it clear that that deal is not going to happen, but he often offers a sweetheart deal of his own. So Yanukovych, on November 21st, says no to the EU. This leads to a series of protests. The Ukrainian government, truth be told, uh, under Yanukovych, overreacts to the protests, which causes them to spiral out of control. And in January of 2014, you can see there, January 22nd, 2014, you have your first two deaths in the protests. These are the Maidan protests. And then in the February 18th through February 20th time period, lots of people die. It's really messy. And what happens is that a number of European foreign ministers, the German foreign minister, French foreign minister, they fly to Kiev and a deal is worked out uh, to have elections that will, in effect, remove Yanukovych from power. Uh, but the protesters refuse to accept the deal. And there are significant fascist elements among the protesters who are armed, right? There's killing on the Maidan. And as a result, Yanukovych flees for his life to Russia. And this all happens on February 22nd. So here are the key events after the coup. On February 23rd, parliament votes to repeal minority language laws in the East. This is basically the Russian language. Uh, and then on February 27th, Russian units begin seizing checkpoints in the Crimea. On the 28th, Additional Russian forces begin moving into the Crimea. The Russians didn't conquer or invade Crimea. Excuse me, the Russians didn't invade Crimea. They were already there because they had a leasing agreement. There's a naval base at Sevastopol, and the Russians were leasing that naval base from Ukraine. So they had military forces there. So when it says Russian units begin seizing checkpoints on the 27th, those were Russian units that were already there. Then additional Russian forces begin moving in on the 28th. And then on the 6th, the 16th, and the 18th, you have a scenario, you have a handful of events that lead to Russia incorporating Crimea. Ukraine is in a state of crisis. Two days after the country's democratically elected president was ousted following months of street protests that left at least 82 people dead. On Saturday, Ukraine's parliament voted to remove President Viktor Yanukovych, a move Yanukovych described as a coup. I am absolutely confident that this is an example which our country and the whole world has seen, an example of a coup. 
Я никуда не собираюсь уезжать в страну. I'm not going to leave Ukraine or go anywhere. I'm not going to resign. I'm a legitimately elected president. I was given guarantees by all international mediators who I worked with that they are giving me security guarantees. I will see how they will fulfill that role. Viktor Yanukovych speaking Saturday. He has not been seen publicly since then. Earlier today, Ukraine's new leaders announced the ousted president was wanted for mass murder of peaceful protesters. On Sunday, Ukraine's interim president, Alexander Turchinov, said he would focus on closer integration with the European Union. Another priority is returning to the European integration course, the fight for which Maidan started with. We must return to the family of European countries. We also understand the importance of our relations with Russia to build relations with this country on a new, just, equal and goodwill basis, which recognizes and takes into account the European choice of the country. I hope that it is this choice that will be confirmed in the presidential elections on the 25th of May of this year. We guarantee that they will fully subscribe to the highest European standards. They will be liberal and fair. I've followed the conflict in Ukraine for a while. Obviously, you're a very powerful guy. I heard you have a sniper rifle in your office. <laughs> Turchinov is a controversial guy. In 2014, he stepped in as Ukraine's acting president. With us in the Ukrainian city of Odessa is Nikolai Petro, professor of politics at the University of Rhode Island. He's been in Odessa since July 2013 as a Fulbright research scholar. Uh, Nikolai Petro, let's begin with you in Ukraine. Um, do you agree with what the president, or now the former president, Yanukovych, said, that this is a coup? Yes. Uh, it's pretty much a classical coup, because under the current constitution, and the president may, be re may resign or be impeached, but only after the case is reviewed by the Constitutional Court and then voted by a three-fourths majority of the parliament. And then in either case, either the prime minister or the speaker of the parliament must become the president. Instead, that's not what happened at all. There was an extraordinary session of parliament after what was held, after most members were told there'd be no session and many had left town. And then under the chairmanship of the radical party Sloboda, this rump parliament declared that the president had self-removed himself from the presidency. And what are the forces that brought this about? And what's happening right now in Ukraine? You're not in Kiev, you're in Odessa. What is even happening there? Uh, the situation here in Odessa is pretty quiet. I would say that what led up to this is a coalition of three distinct forces. One is the group uh, that started at the end of J uh, November of last year, genuine civic frustration with the government's decision to delay the signing of the EU association agreement. This was then seized upon by the parliamentary opposition, who joined belatedly and pressed the government for further concessions. And finally, the actual coup was accomplished thanks to the armed intervention of extreme nationalists read, <laughs> led by the um, right sector. And the fact that they were so instrumental in accomplishing this, uh, this change of power has put them in the driver's seat. From now on, whatever political decisions are arrived at will really be at the sufferance of the right sector. Professor Timothy Snyder, would you agree with this assessment of what's taking place in Ukraine right now? I think parts of it are exactly right. I think I think I would disagree with certain parts of it. For one thing, when it comes to the question of how these changes came about, it's a little bit reductionist just to mention opposition politicians, the right wing in Europe. The the movement, the protest movement at the Maidan included millions of people in Kiev and all around the country. It included people from all walks of life both genders, it included people from, um, included Muslims, it included Jews. 
It included professionals, it included working class people. And the main demand of the movement the entire time was something like normality, the rule of law. And the reason why this demand could bring together such people of different political orientations, such different regional backgrounds, is that they were faced up against someone, the, 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 the previous president, Yanukovych, whose game, whose game was to monopolize both financial and political, as well as, as violent power, in one place. Uh, the Constitution, legitimacy of which is now contested, was violated by him multiple times, um, and most of the protesters agreed to that. The second thing that I would modify a bit would be this idea that what happened is a coup where now somehow everything is determined by, by the right. The parliament does not, is not represented. Um, nobody from the right sector is in parliament. The people who are making the decisions in parliament come from the conventional political parties. If you look at the people who are on top, who are they? The, 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 the acting president is from the southeast. He's a Russian speaker. He's a Baptist pastor, by the way. The two candidates for president, Klitschko and Timoshenko, are both Russian speakers. Klitschko studied in Kiev. Timoshenko is from the southeast. Let's look at the power ministries. If you were a right-wing revolutionary, this is the first thing you go for. Who now occupies the power ministries? The defense minister is a Russian speaker who is actually of Roma origin, of gypsy origin. Um, the interior minister is half Russian, half Armenian. And the Minister of Internal Affairs is a Russian speaker from the far southeast, from Zaporizhia. So it seems extremely unlikely to me that this government is something which could possibly have been dictated by, by nationalists from, from Western Ukraine. This, this government, if anything, is tilted towards the south and, and towards the east. Do you think this could lead to a split between east and west Ukraine? Professor Snyder. No. On the contrary, the one thing which could lead to a split, sorry, the one thing that could lead to a split between East and West Ukraine would be some kind of intervention from the outside. We have, um, we have good polling data taken over the course of the last 20 years from all regions of Ukraine. In no region of Ukraine do more than 4 percent of the population express a wish to leave the country. I'm pretty sure in most states in the United States, the percentage would be much higher than that. The normal response is about 1 percent. Ukraine is a diverse country, but diversity is supposed to be a good thing. It's a multinational state in which the, both this revolution and the people who oppose this revolution have various kinds of ethnic identifications, various kinds of political commitments. The person who started the, the, the demonstrations in November was a Muslim. The first people who came were university students from Kiev. The next people who came were Red Army veterans. When, when the regime started to kill people, the first person who was killed was an Armenian. The second person who was killed was a Belarusian. In the, the sniper massacre of last, last week, which is what directly led to the change of power, um, uh, the, one of the people who was killed was a left-wing ecologist Russian speaker from, from, from Kharkiv, Yevhen Kotlyov. Another was a Pole. The people who took part in this protest represent the variety of the country. The people who oppose these protests also come from various parts of the country. This is an essentially political dispute. And I think the good news is that once Yanukovych was removed, violence ceased, and now we're on a political track in which um, power is no longer in the hands of an interior minister who is killing people and instead is within the chambers of parliament. Parliament has renewed the 2004 Constitution, which makes the system a parliamentary system, and it's called for elections in May. In those elections, people from all over the country will be able to express themselves in a normal post-revolutionary way. And then we'll see where things stand. And last week, uh, Democracy Now! spoke to Russia scholar Stephen Cohen, who said Ukraine is essentially two different countries. Ukraine is splitting apart down the middle because Ukraine is not one country, contrary to what the American media, which speaks about the Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Historically, ethnically, religiously, culturally, politically, economically, it's two countries. One half wants to stay close to Russia, the other wants to go west. We now have reliable reports that the anti-government forces in the streets and there's some very nasty people among them, are seizing weapons in Western Ukrainian military bases. So we have clearly the possibility of a civil war. That's Stephen Cohen. Nikolai Petro, would you agree? <clears throat> Professor Cohen is right that there are very serious differences between the regions, and they go deep 
uh, to the historical memory of not just what World War II was about, but what the end of the Russian Empire was about, what the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Poland, uh, the parts of Ukraine that were under it, were about. Professor Snyder is, however, also correct um, on the fact that much of the country does not want to dissolve. Uh, there is a commitment to being Ukrainian, and it would be indeed to everyone's advantage here if the country, if the parliament really did reach out to um, the segments of the population that are not, uh, that have been effectively disenfranchised by the last coup. And, however, I would tend to disagree because the first steps within 24 hours that they've taken are exactly the opposite. Let me give you an example. The repeal of the law allowing Russian to be used locally, that's the main irritant in East-West relations within the Ukraine. The introduction of a resolution to outlaw the Communist Party of the Ukraine, which effectively is the only remaining opposition party in Parliament. The consolidation of the powers of the Speaker of the Parliament and the acting president in a single individual, giving him greater powers than allowed under any Ukrainian constitution. Of course, the call for the arrest of the president. Now we have effectively a parliament that rules without any representation from the majority party, since most of the deputies of the east and the south of the country are afraid to set foot in parliament. Meanwhile, all across the country, Headquarters of parties are being sacked by their opponents. This is the stage which we have for the elections for May 25th. Will they be fair? There's no money, according to the, prime, um, the acting president and speaker. Vigilante militias routinely attack and disperse public gatherings they disapprove of. News broadcasts. Yesterday, Inter was interrupted by forces claiming to speak for the people. What do you think? These are the scenes that triggered the breakup of Ukraine. Scenes that have brought the world to the brink of a new Cold War. Unarmed protesters gunned down in the streets by the riot police who were retreating from Kiev's Maidan Square. By the end of the day, more than 50 people were dead, including three policemen. Ukraine's new leaders maintain that responsibility for the shootings lies entirely with the security forces acting on behalf of the previous government. Our investigations suggest that is not the full picture. Only three people have been arrested over the killings. All of the members of this police unit seen firing here towards the protesters. That was after nine o'clock in the morning as government forces retreated from the square. But what prompted the police to pull back? Earlier that morning, Andrei Shevchenko, then an opposition politician and part of the Maidan movement, had received a call from the police commander on the square. He calls me and he says, Andrei, someone is shooting at my guys. And he said that uh, the shooting was from the conservatory. He said, second floor, it's, fire, uh, it's firearms, and uh, please do something about that. because it's getting really bad. The conservatory building was under the control of the protesters. On the morning of the 20th, there were persistent reports of gunfire coming from there. Now, for the first time, one of those gunmen has spoken on camera. He was part of the protest movement, he said, and agreed to talk to us 
on condition that we disguise his identity. We will call him Sergei. I was shooting downwards at their feet. Of course I could have hit them in the arm or anywhere, but I didn't shoot to kill. I also shot upwards at the police who were on top of the Globus shopping center. And that is why they retreated. Sergei says that he took up a position behind one of these pillars here. And he mentions being able to see that clock over there on the far side of the square on the bank and the edge of the shopping center, which was the part of the square that was controlled by the riot police. So from here, he had a bird's eye view right over the front line. Amid the chaos, the man in charge of security at the protest camp sent his men to search the conservatory building. They went and checked all the floors. Roughly half an hour later, they returned and told me there were no firing positions from the conservatory. Lawyers and prosecutors say their attempts to find out what really happened on that day are being blocked by the courts. In the absence of a thorough and transparent investigation, conspiracy theories flourish. Many Ukrainians believe the shootings on the 20th were a provocation, planned and orchestrated by Moscow in order to justify the annexation of Crimea and spark a separatist movement in the east. Russians counter that Maidan was a CIA-inspired coup. Neither side offers credible evidence for its claims. Maidan was overwhelmingly made up of peaceful, unarmed citizens who braved months of sub-zero temperatures to demand a change to their corrupt government. There's much we still don't know about what happened that day, but it's clear that some of the shooting was coming from the protesters' side. Gabriel Gatehouse, BBC News, in Kiev. Well, I, look, uh, obviously Putin has his mission and he clearly does see himself in the way that Professor Cohen just outlined. But here's the thing, you know, obviously there's been, uh, you know, a major sort of argument over Ukraine. But Putin and the Russians have by treaty their big Black Sea fleet in Sebastopol in the Crimea. Uh, there was no indication that the new Ukrainian government uh, was going to change that reality at all. And you say that Putin has telegraphed, you know, what his aims are and that he's not a thug. Well, look, I would like you to explain to me how he and us can justify the trumping up of this hysteria in the Crimea, which has given the Russians the ability to do what they're doing, whether it was well, the trumped up change of government in the, in the Crimean parliament, whether it was the trumped up call by this government for uh, Russians right. to come in and protect them when they were not being killed, Professor Cohen, there was no violence in the Crimea, whether it was the horrendous, and I've done a lot of reporting on hate speech, and nationalistic speech and on incitement to war and hatred and the uh, state Russian media is very bad ahead, right Professor now Kong. on this. No, no, this is the facts. And now you have the Duma uh, debating right. an annexation law. All of this is trumped up to provide Putin with what you say and that is his uh, desire to, to protect their interests and to keep his sphere of influence. Yeah. Professor Cohen. The extremism didn't come from Russia. It was coming from Western Ukraine. We've left the large part of the story out. There's a small but resolute and determined right-wing nationalist movement in Ukraine. It's quasi-fascist, and it is dictating terms to this parliament in Kiev, which is not legitimate in law, international, or constitutional. This parliament, which is a rump parliament because they banned the two majority parties that represented the East, have been passing anti-Russian uh, legislation. They banned the use of Russian as an official language. It isn't Russia that's been spewing this ideological, destabilizing uh, message. It's been coming from the West. And here the worst part is, that has been. That hatred has been supported by Washington and Brussels in embracing this West Ukrainian movement. That, will, that must stop. I got to Crimea and I really saw a big difference in what was being shown in the Western media and what was actually going on. I mean, before I got there, I, I saw that 
you know, it, the, the media was making it seem like, you know, Russia was trying to make the, the, the locals in Crimea become more towards uh, Russia and part of Russia. But once I got there, I just saw, you know, the overwhelming support and just, you know, sea of uh, Russian flags and everything. And just, you know, the, virtually almost every single person was that I met uh, uh, was for uh, Russia and becoming part of Russia. I mean, the people that were born there before 1956 were born in Russia. So it right. just just makes sense to them uh, to, to be, go back. And then once uh, I stayed, was there for the referendum, and then once that kind of fizzled off and started calming down, once you know Russia was in, and you know, you know, it was a, a, a done deal for, for, uh, pretty much. Uh, then Donetsk started to develop. I ended up going to Donetsk uh, here and staying, uh, showing the referendum here as well. Again, how it was a lot different than the, the West was making it out to, to seem, um, you know, seeing the fact that there's no uh, Ukrainian language spoken here. There's, you know, the vast majority of the population is ethnically Russian. And um, people were free to leave if they wanted, to stay if they wanted. Okay. And all people who stayed were able to get Russian uh, citizenship. And, uh, and yes, it, 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 the people were extremely happy. And I've gone back to Crimea every year. Well, except for 2020. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, every year besides that, it, back to Crimea, uh, for one, to do a little uh, reportage and see how the situation is and just to have a little vacation in the summer as well because of uh, really amazing beaches there, just right. really a nice place. So basically what you're saying is when that switched over to officially becoming part of Russia, uh, there really wasn't uh, you know, a lot of turmoil there. Most of the people there were ethnically Russian. They were able to get Russian citizenship. Everyone there speaks Russian already. So it's a very easy transition, more or less. And uh, right now it's been pretty peaceful over the last few years in Crimea. You go back every summer, nice beaches, nice holiday. Um, so that's a good that's a good insight, I think, for, for people better understanding that. Tell us more about this, the, this eastern part of Ukraine, uh, you know, the Donbass region that we hear about, because we know that there has been a lot of conflict there for the past eight years. Um, and I think it's a very similar setup. Is it right? You know, similar to Crimea, there's a tremendous amount of ethnic Russians uh, you know, mostly Russian language is being spoken in this region. Do you see a similar sentiment where people are wanting to have the same thing as Crimea? Right? Would they want to be part of Russia? They want to be cut off from Ukraine and part of the Russian Republic? Well, I, I will tell you with uh, one one thing. Um, the locals that live here do not consider this part of Eastern Ukraine uh, okay. anymore. Yeah, that's something that kind of uh, went out the window uh, after the referendum eight years ago, um, and especially now that all this new developments are happening, uh, especially uh, with the recognition from Russia. And over the last two years, Russia has been issuing uh, uh, Russian passports and citizenships uh, to the locals here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, every... These people have been living under eight years of war. That's what a lot of people in the West don't realize is, yeah, um, Russia is invading uh, 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 Ukraine right now, but that's not the start of the war. Uh, the war started in 2014, and these people here in Donetsk have been under intense uh, attack uh, year after year from Ukrainian territory. They've been fighting back, of course, but uh, I mean, they started this with protests in 2014 um, after, my, uh, after Maidan and after Crimea, and a lot of them uh, uh, hoped and prayed that uh, after seeing what happened in Crimea, that Russia was able to, you know, absorb Crimea again. They thought the same thing was going to happen here. Once they did their referendum, they right. put up their borders. But unfortunately, once they did all that, they put up their borders. Ukraine said, no, we're not going to let that fly. And this eight-year war ensued with thousands and thousands of civilians dying. I mean, I'm just, I've been working here on this side of the contact line in the, the anti-Ukraine government territory. So I've only been able to show what happens here but what i've seen here with my own eyes is indiscriminate shelling of civilian areas year after year um by ukrainian forces uh it, it could 
indiscriminate and targeted. In fact, just last month, uh, there was uh, two electric plants, civilian electric plants targeted by Ukraine forces. Um, and the, and the, now that the war is really hot, attacks are coming in every hour. And, I mean, every the only thing that's being shown in the West is uh, uh, the results of Ukrainian or Russian attacks on Ukraine. But what the West isn't showing is every day here in Donetsk there is uh, attacks from Ukraine-controlled territory. Ukraine attacking the civilian population here. Uh, in the last uh, uh, 12 days, there has been 19 civilians killed. I mean, it's not a huge amount like across Ukraine right now, but in the last 12 d days in the Donetsk uh, People's Republic-controlled territory, there's been 19 uh, civilians killed, and I believe 17, uh, or excuse me, 27 injured. Um, and these are results of U Ukrainian attacks on mostly civilian areas. Of course, uh, battle has been raging on the front line uh, since this new development happened and even before. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, a lot of the shells are hitting civilian areas, and I assume a lot are hitting military areas as well. Um, those aren't as free to report on as the other ones. But I'm hitting the front every day, showing what I can on, of the situation. Um, but yeah, the, that's what the West doesn't realize is the, the effect the toll has taken on the people here in Donetsk and across this whole, uh, what they call the, you know, what, what the West calls the Eastern Ukraine area. Um, I mean, the civilian population, there's still some on the streets here, um, you know, walking, I'm in the center of Donetsk, but, uh, I mean, these people are, are, are war hardened. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if you can notice from afar, but most of the people that are walking around now are all, uh, women. Children are elderly because all of the men of military age have been mobilized to go to the war. This isn't just the Russian military that's at this war. The entire uh, male population of these republics, both the Donetsk and Lugansk people's republics, have been mobilized, or you can say drafted or conscripted, or however you want to put it, to go to the front and, and fight. Um, so, yeah, these these people are really under a huge amount. And there's been a mass evacuation, whereas a a lot of the civilians have evacuated. The women, children, and uh, elderly. The latter still here. They didn't want to leave without their men, but uh, a lot of evacuated. People already consider this part of Russia now, especially because uh, they're recognized by Russia. That they're just waiting. They're just waiting for Russia to say, okay. You're part of Russia now. They look right. at everything as a stepping a stepping stone. At first w was uh, uh, having the referendum. It didn't come as quick as they thought it would after that being part of Russia. But then Russia issuing passports to the locals here. Um, well, and before that, issuing their own passports because there there is the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic passports. After that came Russian passports, uh, and then a few weeks ago the rec the official recognition of um, the, the republics by Russia, and everybody thinks the next step is going to be the republics being part of Russia, or the republics staying part of uh, Ukraine, but this Ukraine, as we all know, is going to be a totally different uh, Ukraine. Um, it, whatever happens, it's not, not going to be anything like it was before. Um, yeah. So, may, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a question about that. I mean, my, my, from... From my perspective, I, I see these two breakaway regions that, you know, are ethnically very, you know, very Russian influenced. They ethnically, um, you know, they feel Russian, they speak Russian, they have Russian passports now. Essentially, these two regions want to be part of Russia, which potentially could happen. Now, do you think that Putin's war, you know, against Ukraine, is this really just about these two regions? In my mind, why wouldn't, why wouldn't Putin enter in and just try to take these two regions away? as opposed to bombing the entire country. Does, do you think that Putin wants more? Does he want the all of Ukraine? Is that, is that really his, his end game here, is to try to take over the entire country? It's a good question, because uh, when the, the 12 days ago, when the war started, everybody was shocked. I was shocked. I've been here for eight years most of the time, and everybody is shocked about uh, how this is playing out.
um, because at max, the majority of journalists, people that are really have been here on this side of contact in the, in the know of what, you know, what's happening, what's been happening, see the, the, you know, the, the toll this has had on the people and what the, the Russian, uh, ideas are and things, uh, when this hit Kiev and hit hit the west of Ukraine, everybody's in shock. Everybody right. thought it was just going to go as far as Donbass, right. Lugansk, and Donetsk uh, regions, and basically the original borders of the uh, the the republics before Ukraine came and took over, uh, took back over half of the republic. It's really unclear. Uh, I mean, I, I would think the majority of people are thinking that he's just making sure that the attacks on these republics aren't going to continue. Um, I mean, it's really, it's just all speculation. I, I hate to put, uh, you know, false opinions out that are, are I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how this is going to play out. I don't personally think he's going to take over Ukraine. I think okay. the uh, existing government in Ukraine is through. Uh, there's going to be another government uh, put in place. How far how far it's going to go, I I, I can't uh, say. Um, but it is a fact that if Ukraine would have left these republics, the Donetsk and Lugansk republics alone, and uh, stopped attacking when they over and over again had a ceasefire, uh, if, if U Ukraine would have let them break away peacefully, Ukraine would not be in the state it is right now. That is a fact.